I wake up and I think about music, but I try to do as much as I can to work on animal rights. Like if you held a gun to my head and said I had a choice between working on music and working on animal rights, I would choose animal rights. Like nothing, as I said earlier, like nothing is more important to me than my animal rights activism. You know, I would, I would die tomorrow or right now if it advanced the cause of animal rights. Moby's a music pioneer who's also a passionate vegan. Born in New York and now living in Los Angeles, we met to speak about his animal rights activism and how his priorities have changed over time. I hope that over time I've become less selfish. You know, like if we were talking 20 some odd years ago, I would have mainly been focused on my career and I would have been a passionate animal rights ad advocate and activist, but I wouldn't have been spending much time on it. And now I actually see my animal rights activism as being more important than anything else I do. Has that been a natural evolution or has that been a proactive decision that you took at one point in your life? Well, I think as time has passed, I've just sort of seen my selfish concerns as being just less important and my animal activism as being more important. I mean, honestly, I wish, I wish we lived in a perfect world where people had the luxury of being selfish, you know, but we live in a world that's an inch away from complete cataclysm where hundred some odd billion animals are killed for human purposes every year. So if we lived in a world that didn't have climate change, where animals weren't used for food, where we only had sustainable energy, then by all means be selfish. But the world in which we live doesn't afford people the right or luxury to be selfish anymore. Is that what initially motivated you? You mentioned the environment and the animals there. Is, was that the case from the beginning or has that well, changed? At first, I mean, I had the strange, we'll call it the human paradox of loving animals and eating animals. You know, when I was growing up, I, I loved the rescue animals we had, but I also ate at Burger King. And then when I was 19, I was petting one of our rescue cats and all of a sudden the switch got thrown in my brain. And I realized that this cat I was petting had two eyes and a central nervous system and a really wonderful, rich life. And I suddenly realized, oh, every animal with two eyes and a central nervous system has an incredibly rich life and just wants to live their life according to their own will. And that's when I became a vegetarian and then a few years later became a vegan as I found out more about the way in which animals were used in like egg and dairy production. When I became a vegan in 1987, no one knew how to say the word vegan. You know, we didn't know if it was vegan or vegan or vegan, you know, so you'd go to a restaurant and you would ask the person like, do you have, do you have vegan food? And the person would say like, I think we have vegan food. Like, so 30 years ago, no one knew what this movement was called. Um, and clearly in those 30 years, the movement has grown remarkably. And one of the things that's amazing to me in the animal rights movement now is up until recently, the cause of animal rights was based on animal welfare. But now when we're advancing the cause of animal rights, we can talk about animals, we can talk about antibiotic resistance, we can talk about climate change, we can talk about rainforest deforestation, famine, water use, ocean acidification, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, all these things that are a result of animal agriculture. So there's so many more powerful ways to be an animal rights activist. You know, I know that there are some people like Jim Cameron, I don't even know if he thinks about animals that much, but he's a committed vegan and a committed activist from a climate perspective, from an environmental perspective, from a health perspective. Moby's electronic music career saw him sell over 20 million records worldwide. He gained international success with his fifth studio album, Play, and has also co-written, produced, and remixed music for Michael Jackson, David Bowie, Daft Punk, and Britney Spears, among many, many others. We asked him whether he thinks there is any synergy between his creative outputs and his ethical values. 
I think that a lot of my quasi-legitimacy or legitimacy as an activist is informed by my life as a musician. Um, that is the synergy between activism and creativity. Uh, I have never been good at writing issue-oriented songs. So I try to use my status as a public figure and my creative output as a way to sort of advance my activism and address my activist concerns. But I don't know how to write animal rights music, you know? And I don't know, I mean, because like in the punk rock world, you know, like Earth Crisis and there's some, there's some bands, Shelter, who've written animal rights based songs. But for the most part, it's really hard to take activism and channel it through lyrics. Some people are good at it, I'm just not very good at it. Is that because your music is, your music is mainly instrumental music? So. Uh, I don't know, I just, I, I mean, the music I make tends to be more emotional and subjective and not necessarily specific and issue oriented. Moby produced the music for the critically acclaimed documentary Earthlings, which was narrated by Joaquin Phoenix and detailed humanity's use of other animals as pets, food, clothing, entertainment, and for scientific research. Moby has also been involved in other campaigns and recently announced the launch of a vegan festival with Mercy for Animals this October. Whether it's appearing on shows like The Young Turks to talk about animal rights, opening a vegan restaurant, or donating generously to good causes, Moby's commitment cannot be questioned. We next asked him, what achievement is he most proud of? So in 1989, I used to be a very serious Christian, and now I like quantum mechanics and Taoism, and I'm just the world, the universe is a complicated place, so I can't call myself a Christian anymore. But when I used to be a very serious Christian, at one point, I was thinking of giving up everything and going to be a minister. This was the late 80s, and I couldn't do it. And instead, I spent the next couple of decades working on a career. And, and one of the good things about that is I've managed to save some money that I can now give to animal rights organizations. So if there's anything I'm proud of, it's being able to support full-time activists. You know, because like the people who are working at Mercy for Animals, at Compassion Over Killing, at the Humane Society, the people who are doing the day in, day out work, like they're the people who deserve most of my support. You know, the people who are going undercover. So the fact that I can, in my small way, financially support them. And I sometimes think of that, like if I'm on the verge of buying something I don't need, I think to myself like, okay, do I really need a second house? Do I, do I need a private plane? Of course not. I can fly commercial and I've got a perfectly nice house. I'd rather take that money and help the cause of animal rights. Which organizations do you help? Uh, Mercy for Animals? Yeah, right? well, when it comes to animal rights organizations, I my main focus is uh, farm animals and health. So the two organizations I'd say I work, well, three organizations I work most closely with would be Mercy for Animals, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and the Humane Society. Mercy for Animals are exclusively focused on farm animals. Um, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is run by vegan doctors and they do amazing work. And then Humane Society is the biggest and they have a legislative arm that is changing the world. What do you say to the people that are critical of those organizations because they, um, they are for animal welfare? Uh, again, we are a tiny movement, you know, and we have, we don't have many people and we don't have much in the way of resources. So, and, and I feel like we have to deal with the world as it is. So I am a committed abolitionist but I will work with anyone, you know, like I fully believe in radical animal rights. But if there's someone at Mercy for Animals or the Humane Society who is in the field meeting with farmers, meeting with ranchers, meeting with fast food companies, making incremental progress, God bless them. You know, like, like sometimes we need, it's the small, unglamorous incremental steps that lead to big change. And it's too easy to sit back 
and criticize the people who are making the small incremental steps. Have there been any moments in the last year or so that really give you hope for the movement? Uh, every day there's another article somewhere talking about the role of animal agriculture in climate change, in rainforest deforestation, cancer, diabetes, obesity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And also every day there are countless pictures on social media of beautiful animals. So I feel like people, their hearts are opening up thanks to all the images of amazing animals and their brains are opening up based on all the information about the consequences of animal agriculture. And when these things meet, the world will change. And I truly believe that pretty soon animal agriculture will be seen as in the same realm as cigarette smoking, racism, anti-Semitism, you know, things that are like old and terrible, you know? So if, hum if humans manage to live for a hundred years, Within a hundred years, there will be no more animal agriculture on this planet. Or if there is, it will be so small compared to what we have today. Your role models are so, so many people. Who are your role models? My role models, um, first and foremost, and this might be either obvious or weird, is Gandhi. You know, Gandhi was a lawyer in South Africa who reluctantly became an activist and changed the course of human history with what you could call the biggest social movement ever. You know, he took India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh away from the British and gave them home rule, which when he started was inconceivable. So that, I look at that and then I look at people like Wilbur Wilberforce and some of the early abolitionists against slavery and I think, oh, they went up against things that were way bigger than what we're up against and way more intractable than what we're up against and they won. So they're my role models. And then, of course, like John Robbins, Peter Singer, you know, a lot of the people who've been working on animal activism for a long time. And then historically, everyone from Tolstoy to Da Vinci, you know, all the, all the historical vegans. Let's talk about your restaurant. Uh, who is the last person you ever thought you'd see dining in your restaurant? Well, when we first opened Little Pine, my restaurant in Silver Lake, there was one night when, uh, it was actually one weekend when Ellen DeGeneres and Miley Cyrus and Salman Rushdie and Cory Booker and David Fincher were all in at roughly the same time having dinner. And I remember thinking like, and, and Miley was the only vegan, or actually no, Miley and Cory, but like, it's my goal with the restaurant is of course, I want to make the vegans happy, but I want to reach the non-vegans. You know, that's why I don't drink, I'm straight edge, but we have a great wine and beer selection because I want people to come in and be like, oh, this is vegan food and it's normal and it's good. And this is a nice restaurant where people can go in and have a nice experience. So it's not, I'm evangelical and didactic as an activist, but my restaurant is more based on the idea of attraction than promotion. What is the, the best next step for veganism? The next best step for veganism, I presumptuously believe, is for us to take stock of what we're doing, figure out what works, figure out what doesn't, and very simply spend more time and money on what works and less time and money on what doesn't. And I believe that what doesn't work is infighting. I believe that what doesn't work is taking all of our money and funneling it through rescue organizations. We need some, but we don't need as many as we have. And what does work is being unified and fighting for legislative change and changing culture. Lastly, what are your plans for the future? My plan for the future is to stay alive as long as I can working on animal rights activism.